McIntyre, a pastor here at First Baptist in downtown Columbia. We are delighted that you've decided to join us for worship via our webcast. If you are a regular attender and you're homesick or you're on vacation, we miss you. We wish you were here. If you're just checking us out for the first time, we hope you enjoy worshiping with us and that you'll visit us in person sometime. Let's continue in worship together. Welcome to worship here at First Baptist.
Well, good morning and welcome to worship this morning. It's good to have all of you here with us. Whether you are a guest or a regular attender, I ask you to take just a moment, take this little welcome tab out of your worship guide and fill that out and let us know if you have any changes in your email address or your address. And also if you have any prayer requests, we do pray for those weekly and send those out in our email prayer list. Secondly, you will see that in your worship bulletin is this little save the date uh, card. I hope you'll take that home and hang that on your refrigerator, put these in your uh, phone and save the dates for all the upcoming events. We have dates all the way to April, so you know what we're up to here at First Baptist. So take that home and put that uh, on your refrigerator. If you'll flip to the back of your bulletin, you'll see that we have some other announcements for you this morning. Just a reminder that today is our fall kickoff and annual picnic, and immediately following this worship service, we'll have uh, lunch on the front lawn, and I hope you'll join us for food and fun. The inflatable alligator is already blown up out there, and a couple of people have already tested it out. You can be next. So you'll notice there are many other announcements in our bulletin today and just want to make note that um, our children's ministry is in an interim, as you all know, and the personnel committee is in the process of looking for a part-time children's minister, and I hope that you will spread the word about that so we can find some great candidates for that position but also in the interim, I just wanted to let you know that Marilyn Zumwalt and Jane Hunter have agreed to be the overseers of our children's ministry so that things will go smoothly and be well taken care of in the interim. So let's turn our hearts and our minds to the worship of God this morning.
speaks to us, but we are too busy, too frazzled to hear. Will you join me in the prayer of confession that we will read in unison? We come before you today, O oh God, torn among our many responsibilities, the varied roles we play in our careers and relationships and the desires of our heart. So often we have identified ourselves too closely with our jobs and responsibilities, forgetting that we are much more in your sight. Broaden our vision and our self-understanding. Forgive us where we have allowed ourselves to compromise our convictions on the altar of convenience. Open our eyes to the ways we foolishly allow the ends to justify the means. Forgive us for treating things like treasures and people like things. Make us sensitive to the people with whom we work and live. Call our priorities back into order. Amen. In Jesus Christ, God knows and receives us as we are. Listen, give thanks, and live. Our sins are forgiven. Amen. So it is with joy in our hearts that we pass the peace this morning and greet those around us.
as you're making your way back to your seats. As you're making your way back to your seats, I want to invite our Child Development Center teachers and staff to come up this morning. We want to recognize you all at the beginning of the school year and board too. If you're a board member of CDC, you want to come up. Do you have any board members in here? I know we have a couple. So at the first of the school year, we like to remind ourselves that we have this incredible Child Development Center here at First Baptist, that this has been one of the ministries that we have to our community um, for the past 45 years. Um, I'm grateful as a parent for the ministry that they do here in our community, caring for children and providing a safe, nurturing, learning environment for children. And so I think a couple of the CDC folks have a word they're going to say, maybe. This is Debbie, our director of the Child Development Center. Hello. How are you all? <laughs> good, good. Um, I'm the director. I've been here. This is my third year, and I feel very fortunate to be a part of the CDC school. Um, we have a wonderful staff. The First Baptist Church has been very grateful and very thankful for us, and we, in turn, feel the same. I have a wonderful board that we get to work with. Diana's up here, Jane's up here, uh, Joni, and Mary Beth, and uh, I think Verna's back here. Hi, Verna. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to take a moment to thank the First Baptist Church for all the renovations that they've done this past two years. It's been wonderful for the CDC area, and it's also been very beneficial to the second floor for me because I now have a bigger office. And uh, <laughs> it's great, and the parents have more time to come up and more space. The teachers have a nice work area. So it's been a big plus for everybody concerned here um, with the CDC area. Renee. Renee is going to speak on behalf of the staff. Hi, my name's Renee Mahan, and most of you have probably seen me before because I've played with certificates. I've played with the Chancel Bell Group for about 13 years now. But you may not know, I've also been a teacher at CDC for eight years. And not only am I a teacher, but my four children have all either attended or are currently attending CDC. So on behalf of the parents and staff of CDC, I want to thank you, the members of the First Baptist Church, for all the support that you have given us. This summer, the ceiling tiles were all replaced in our classrooms and new LED lights have replaced the old yellowing fluorescent lights. Our floors were professionally stripped and rewaxed, and these look fantastic next to the new paint and the curtains that we received last summer thanks to the CDC board. We have a gorgeous new kitchenette. It has lots of new cabinets, lots of storage space, and a new regular size refrigerator that holds more than a gallon or two of milk. And now with the, with the renovation of the fellowship hall complete, we've also been able to go down there and start having, having our lunch. And this year we have brand new child sized blue tables and we get to use real plates, real cups, real utensils instead of the paper stuff we've been using for the past two years, thanks to the new kitchen and the, the new dishwasher. So I wanna thank you all for your financial support of First Baptist that's made all of these improvements at the Child Development Center possible. There are too many people to name, and I don't want to forget anybody or hurt anybody's feelings, so I'm just going to thank everybody, anybody that helped move furniture out of our rooms or into our rooms so the improvements could be made, um, anybody that's helped spruce up our playground, the flower beds, those people who wrote endowment grants to help pay for some of the improvements, and those who spearheaded the improvements at First Baptist Church that have also helped benefit CDC. And for anyone who has ever said a prayer for any of the students, families, and staff of CDC. The changes made in the last couple of years are a testament to the members of First Baptist and the importance you place on education. So again, on behalf of all the staff and parents of the Child Development Center, thank you, thank you, thank you. The physical appearance of our center, which of course everybody knows 
the appearance are the first impressions that people make. And so for the perspective um, parents of CDC now, they can see physically the wonderful program that we offer through CDC and the First Baptist Church. So thank you. So we want to take just a moment to pray for CDC. And we were also going to get the other kids to come in here, but because they were late, now they're too chicken. So <laughs> we're going to pray for the other kids in spirit. Uh, so let's pray for all of our kids going back to school. And also, do we have any other teachers in the congregation? Because I'd love to have the opportunity to pray for you too. Come on up, Beth. You're a teacher. Yeah, you count. She teaches college. She counts. Any other teachers want to come on up? Mitchell McKinney, we'll pray for you today, too, uh, as another professor. Anybody else? All right. Well, let's pray together, and you'll notice that you have a role in the prayer. You'll say, Lord, hear our prayer. God of wisdom, we give you thanks for schools and classrooms, for teachers and students. We thank you for this new beginning, for new books and new ideas. We thank you for sharpened pencils, pointy crayons, and crisp blank pages waiting to be filled. Lord, we pray that you will bless all the children and youth of First Baptist and of the Child Development Center as they begin yet another year of school. Give these students peace when they feel nervous, focus when they feel distracted, and energy when they feel tired. Open their minds to the lessons they will learn both in and outside the classroom. Help them to make friends that build one another up and to be friends to those who need them. Guide them in making good choices as they grow in wisdom and maturity. Be ever-present with them in the classroom, on the bus, and in the cafeteria. May they sense your loving care, and we ask, O oh God, that you protect them each day of this school year. Lord, bless those in the ministry of teaching. As they embark on a new school year, grant them energy, passion, discipline, and endurance for their daily task. Infuse their classrooms with an atmosphere of care and mutual respect. May all their interactions with students be bathed in patience and understanding. Help their lessons to grow students in both knowledge and character. Help us to support the work these teachers do in building up our community and our future. Lord, we give you thanks for the ministry of the Child Development Center here at First Baptist. Lord, bless the classrooms and the teachers and the students who fill this building every day. We thank you for all the crayons, paper plates, books, markers, and construction paper that will be used to help these children learn. May this be a safe place filled with laughter, learning, joy, and play. All this we ask in the name of Jesus, who as a child in the temple showed us his longing to learn about you and as an adult, taught by story and example, your great love for us. Amen. We're grateful. We're
A reading from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it, that is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me what is his name, what shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. The word of the Lord. Will you please stand and join me in singing hymn 574, Lord, speak to me that I may speak. Lord, speak to me.
So God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight as we seek to draw near to you, to hear from you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So for the last few weeks, we have been talking about Moses, the man behind the movies. More movies have been made about Moses than any other biblical character. And many people's understanding of our passage of scripture for today comes from the 1950s movie, The Ten Commandments. In The Ten Commandments, when Moses sees the burning bush, he is hesitant. He is fearful. He moves like he's in slow motion. And he and God speak in King James English. God says to Moses, Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standeth is holy ground. But if you read the biblical text, when Moses sees this amazing sight, he doesn't stare in stupefied silence. No, he is curious, and he actually has quite a lot to say to the bush. So to get a different perspective on the passage, we're going to watch a clip from the 1998 movie, The Prince of Egypt. I promise we'll watch Ten Commandments in the coming weeks, but here you go. Randy, you want to just turn it off then? <laughs> Thanks for telling me, Sherry. Now Randy has to go all the way back upstairs. Well, that was awesome. So... <laughs> day like any other day. Moses gets up early. He brews some coffee over the fire. He makes some oatmeal. Forty years earlier, Moses had fled Egypt. Forty years earlier. By this time, he has gotten married. He's had a couple of kids. Now he spends his days running his father-in-law's business. He is a shepherd, and he's out in the wilderness tending sheep. The Bible actually says he is beyond the wilderness. Beyond the wilderness meaning he is far from home. To be exact, he's on Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, which is called the Mountain of God. And when they are free from Egyptian slavery, this is the very place where the Israelites will worship God, and this is the place where Moses will receive the Ten Commandments. But for now, Moses is herding sheep. He's herding sheep when all of a sudden he sees this bizarre sight. Moses looks up the hill and sees a thorn bush, an ordinary bush, that is burning but isn't being consumed. And when he sees it, he does not think it's God. He just thinks it's weird. Right? He isn't afraid. He is curious. And he walks toward the bush to check it out. And then God speaks from the bush 
Take off your shoes, Moses, for the place you're standing is holy ground. It's like God wants Moses to plant his feet firmly on the ground. The ground is probably warm, maybe even hot from the sun. God wants Moses to feel that dirt beneath his feet. It's like God is saying, this is ordinary dirt you're standing on, but it is saturated with the divine, the holy. The Hebrew word for holy means separated. It's a reminder that when God shows up, ordinary things become separated, set apart, holy. Moses' response is fitting. He, he hides his face. Now, if God ever speaks to me from a burning bush, I do not think I will have the guts to argue with God. But not Moses. When God tells Moses that he wants him to go back to Egypt and free the Israelites, Moses puts up a fight that spans the rest of Exodus chapter 3 and almost all of Exodus chapter 4. The God of the universe came down to speak to Moses personally, and Moses argues with God. Throughout the book of Exodus, Moses speaks very frankly with God. He doesn't worry that he might be thrashed by God. He just speaks his mind. Don't you love that? I love that about Moses and about God. This story reminds us that although God is holy, and set apart, God is also personal and approachable. Fast forward, if you will, to today. God is still personal. God is still so personal that God chooses to make God's home within us. When we come to know God and begin a relationship with God, we believe that God's Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, comes to dwell in our hearts. You can't get more personal than that. Moses is a pain. Moses is difficult. He's hard-headed and challenging. But that doesn't stop God from reaching out to him and from using him. And for two chapters, God puts up with Moses' questions. And actually, he answers many of them. And then in chapter 3, verse 13, Moses asked this very intriguing question. God, what is your name? It seems like a simple question, right? God could have said Bob or Susie. God could have given a simple answer. Moses is looking for something he can wrap his mind around. He lives in a culture where gods make sense. His neighbors worship gods made out of stone or wood, statues carved by people. Moses wants to know, are you the god of water, soil, fertility? All his neighbors worship gods like that. But God says, I am who I am. What kind of name is that? Over the years, translators have had just an absolute field day with this name. They've translated it all kinds of ways. They've translated it, the one who always was. I am the first, also the last. I will be what I will be. Or I cause to be what comes into existence and all these are appropriate translations. The name God gives Moses isn't simple. It's like God is saying, don't try to box me in, Moses. I can't be compared to your neighbor's gods. I'm not even in the same category as Ra or Amun. While the meaning of God's name that he reveals to Moses is difficult to grasp, it does tell us something about God. It comes from the Hebrew verb to be, which tells us that God is not just some abstract being. God is active. To be is an active verb. When God says to Moses, I will be with you when you go to Egypt to free my people, God is serious 
This is a joint endeavor. God works through and with Moses to answer the Israelites' prayer. Think about that for a moment. And as Joseph Heller puts it, Moses takes off his shoes and there goes the rest of his life. My guess is that prior to the burning bush, Moses plans to stay right there in Midian for the rest of his life. Maybe he thinks about the Israelites from time to time, but we certainly don't get the impression that he is restless or that he's thinking about leading a revolt. He has settled down. He's gotten married. He has moved on with his life. Moses is simply going about his business when God appears to him out of nowhere and says, Son, I have a plan for you. As followers of Christ, we believe that God issues a call to all of us, each and every one of us. First and foremost, God calls us into relationship with Jesus Christ. God invites us to know God personally and to connect with Jesus. Secondly, we believe that God calls all of us who are in relationship with Jesus to be actively involved in working to bring about the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. God uses Moses to free the Israelites from slavery. This is how God works in the world, through people. We partner with God to make a difference in the world. And sometimes God calls us to do incredible things, like free the Egyptians from slavery, or be the founder of Habitat for Humanity, or open a hospital in Nepal. Sometimes we get to do those things. But most of the time, most of us have much more ordinary callings. Unfortunately, I think there has become this expectation that our calling should be profound. We want to invent something that will save thousands of lives, or we want to write a book that will impact millions of people. We want to be the next big thing. But the truth is, most of us are not Moses. We are Miriam or Aaron. Miriam and Aaron, who's that? They don't get nearly as much screen time as Moses, but they're Moses' siblings, and they are a really important part of the story because God uses them too. In Exodus chapter 4, Moses is still arguing with God, still. And uh, Moses says to God, please, God, please send somebody else. I have never been good with words. I stutter and I stammer. By this time, God's getting a little fed up. The Bible says he gets mad. Fi after two chapters, okay, finally. Finally, God says, don't you have a brother, Aaron? He's good with words. I know he is. You tell him what to say, and he will speak for you. Aaron! is the guy who does the talking. He's the one who speaks to the Israelites. He's the one who speaks to Pharaoh. You don't see that in Exodus, Gods and Kings. Aaron doesn't get the press that Moses does, but his calling is just as important. Calling comes in many forms. A friend of mine who was a pastor in Georgia did a series on calling at his church. And it's kind of cool. Every Sunday for a whole year, they had a different church member stand up and say what their calling was. A little girl in their congregation, a fourth grader, stood up one Sunday and said, My calling this year is to be nice to Billy. Billy is the meanest kid in my class, maybe in our whole school. I think 
God is calling me to be nice to Billy because he needs somebody to show him how to be nice. Calling comes in many forms. Now, the tricky part there was Billy's grandparents were also members of that church. <laughs> but anyway, a couple of weeks ago, I was emailing Marilyn Zumwalt, one of our church members here, and I was emailing her about our children's ministry. And when she emailed me back and I read her email, I was so overcome with gratitude because she wrote in the email to me, I see teaching children Sunday school as my mission. And I thought, what a gift. What a gift we at First Baptist have that she sees teaching our children as our mission. How blessed our kids are. Calling comes in many forms. When I was at home this summer in my hometown visiting my family, I went with my mom to a dentist appointment. Her dentist was my dentist when I was a little kid, right? I grew up in a small town, so he knew me well. He knows me well. He cleaned my teeth, and he watched me play basketball growing up, you know. I was sitting in the waiting room waiting for my mom when my dentist came out to see me. He said, I bet you're surprised I'm still practicing, aren't you? He's retirement age. And he went on to tell me that when he was in his 20s, he thought he would retire at like 55 and play golf two or three days a week, right? And then he said, but now that I've grown older, my priorities have changed. I keep working because well, one, I'm not as good at golf as I was when I was in my 20s. And he said, but I also like to go on mission trips to South America and do dental clinics. It's expensive to do dental clinics, he said. And so I keep working to pay for the dental clinics that I do. Calling can come in many forms. What will you say when God asks you to partner with God to make a difference in the world? God said, go, and I said, who, me? And God said, yes. And I said, but I'm not ready yet. And an important meeting is coming up, and I can't leave work right now. And you know there is no one to take my place. And God said, you're stalling. Again, God said, go. And I said, but I don't want to. And God said, I didn't ask if you wanted and I said, Listen, I'm not the kind of person to get involved in controversy. Besides, my family won't like it. And what will my neighbors think? And God said, Baloney. <laughs> and yet a third time the Lord said, Go. And I said, Do I have to? And God said, And I said, Look, I'm scared. People are going to hate me and cut me up into little pieces, and I can't take it all by myself. And God said, Where do you think I will be? And God said, Go. And I sighed. Here I am. Send me. We're going to stand and sing our hymn of commitment, which is printed in your bulletin on the next page. Here I am, Lord. And as we stand and sing, I'll be here at the front this morning if anyone needs prayer about that calling, perhaps. 
or even about becoming a member of First Baptist, I'd love to speak with you this morning. Let's stand and sing together. this time of offering, we remember that the gifts we give go to great ministries like our Child Development Center. So as you give, do so generously.
Many thanks to one of our students, Jordan Kausler, for being our pianist this afternoon. And also thanks to Lisa Dobbs for leading in worship today in Ed's absence. He's taking a couple days vacation. Let's stand for the benediction, and I hope you will stay for the picnic. If you're a guest and you didn't bring food, don't worry about it. There will be plenty of food. You can come out, eat, go through the alligator. It's going to be a fun afternoon. So let's read the benediction in unison. Go out into the world to join God in the work of love, of peace, of justice. Take in the breath of life. Take off your shoes. Know that you are ever in the presence of the holy and living God. Go in peace. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us. Hope to see you next week, either in person or through our webcast.